I'm John Graft, and I love Chicago real estate. Between showings, I stop in my favorite places, talk with local business owners, and bring their story to you. This is my Chicago. For different kinds of beer, we add things like gypsum and calcium chloride to uh, have the water um, accentuate the flavor of the beer in different ways. Okay. Um, is there something you're looking for with each one of those chemicals? Yeah, it's also um, affecting the overall pH of, of the water. Um, so it really varies like, like gypsum and calcium chloride uh, can uh, most distinctly affect the way that uh, hops uh, taste in a beer. Um, but then, you know, we also add with this recipe, we're adding just a little bit of table salt, which just kind of does what salt does. Got it. Um, Gives a little extra taste. Yeah, which isn't something people normally think of with beer, but... Uh, I was just drinking a, a Mars beer last week that had salt in it. That was, the, like, that was part, and one of the ingredients right on the list. It was interesting. Okay, like a gosa? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So is that a category that has salt in it normally, or is yeah. it a saltier flavor? Yeah. Got it. Yeah, that was my first time having one. It's a good stuff. And what we're making today, is that a, a small batch beer or a big batch beer? It's a big batch beer. Big batch beer. Is there a definition of small? No. No, no we have, so, um, I can explain this in more detail when we're Cool. Yeah, when we have things moving, but we have our uh, seven-barrel brew house and our thirty-barrel brew house um, as a result of uh, how this business kind of came to exist. Um, but yeah, that's a whole other story. So I'm just getting pump some water through the brew house to make sure that uh, everything's rinsed out from the previous cleaning that we did. So this is our hot liquor tank. It's uh, where we heat water to use for brewing and cleaning tanks and whatnot. So I'm just gonna pump some water through uh, So I'm just preheating our mash tun. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is auger in uh, about uh, 2,000 pounds of, of grains um, from our uh, grain crushing room over there uh, to mix with water for our mash. Um, so we wanna get the mash tun hot so that the large amount of cool metal doesn't cool down the Got it. mash. Um, we're mashing it about 150 degrees. Okay. Would you say that's step one? For the uh, process? Well, yeah, milling the grain is, is really step one. That happened yesterday. Okay. There's still a few bags that need to be milled, um, which uh, probably Frankie or Alex will do once I've... So this is our... Oh, uh, wow, okay grain crushing room, so we mill grains that are augered up into the grist case. The grist case doesn't fit quite as much as we need for a lot of batches that we do. So once I start uh, doughing in, as it's called, and augering grains up to the mash tun, then we can fit more. All right, now we use our high-tech device to uh, get the last of the grain out of here. The, the main problem is not getting tired of drinking beer. It's that since we have access to super fresh beer all the time, I'm really sensitive to the age of beers. And uh, it's remarkably hard to find stuff that isn't uh, a little past its prime unless you look pretty hard. So is augering just kind of pumping it through these pipes? Um, so there's like a spiral like a, uh, a metal spiral in the PVC pipe oh. that spins and pulls the grain through. Got it, okay. I was really curious how it moves around. Sure. 
Yeah, it's still kind of like unbelievable to me that that actually works. And that's this pipe right here, right? Yeah, this and PVC. so this actually goes to both brew houses, which is why I was adjusting the uh, string up there. Um, so there's th that motor up there actually turns the, the auger. Um, and then we can uh, either choose to dump here or there. Okay. Although, as you'll see, when we're augering to this brew house, some grain still goes through, which is... Did you help set all this up and how to design it? Yeah. Um, so we first, uh, John and I partnered up with Steve, and I don't know if you met Greg. No. Um, Greg's worked with Steve for, I don't know, like... Forever, right? part of 30 years. Yeah. Uh, so John and I partnered up with those guys to modify a business they had up on Lincoln Avenue, just south of Diversity. Yeah, um, the old, uh, that bowling alley they had there that was a brewery, right? Yeah, so we started the brew pub there in 2012. Um, and uh, and then we, then we uh, opened a production brewery down uh, uh, at near 95th and Cottage Grove. Um, in 2015, uh, and then we merged both of those breweries into this space Got it. two years ago. Is this the production facility? Is that what you consider this? Yeah. Uh, well, so, yeah, I mean, previously we were doing small batches in Lincoln Park and big batches at uh, uh, in Pullman, and now it all just happens in this space, and we have our beer hall in there. Yeah. All right, so I'm just laying some foundation water. There are metal screens in the bottom of the mash tun that act as a filter once we start running wort off um, after it steeps. So I'm just laying some foundation water so the level of the water comes up above the screens and then I'm gonna start uh, augering in the grain. We have cold water piped in here, so I'm pumping hot water through here and then adding just enough cold water to get it to the temperature that I want it at. Making sure the temperature is right where we want it and what what degree is that um so we want the mash at 150 degrees so that means i want uh the the water coming in to show at about uh just under 160. okay and so in like 10 or 15 minutes i'll ask one of the guys to mill in just a few more bags of grain and right. if you want to well perfect how long have you been doing this um before uh, we started the brew pub in Lincoln Park, John and I were just brewing at home. Oh. So it was a good opportunity for us to uh, scale up. And um, so, yeah, so going on nine years. Nice. So just started with a little brew kit and just doing it at home. It's awesome. How'd you get set up with Greg and Steve? Um, we, uh, John met Steve just kind of by chance through a mutual friend, um, uh -huh. and uh, at the time um, I was doing some uh, brewing courses, and John was, uh, he had my book of course materials that he was um, getting back from a friend who was, who was the mutual friend that I spoke of, and so Steve was like, oh, you're studying brewing, and they just started talking. And That's cool. So, and yeah, like Steve has lived in John and I's uh, home neighborhood of Hyde Park for a very long time. So we had a lot of mutual acquaintances that could kind of encourage us to work together. Nice. You never know exactly how much grain's gonna go through to the other brew house. So it's behaving itself today. And are you guys making beer there right now simultaneously? No, John's no. just cleaning. Okay. Uh, we were going to, uh, originally the plan was to brew on that system today, but Christian, our uh, brewer who's been with us for like five years now, uh, uh, called out. Got so, it, and that's what John's doing right now, he's doing his job, like something that um, he normally does? Well, Christian was gonna actually brew the beer on the system today, uh, but because beer isn't getting brewed on the system, um, John's cleaning it. Uh, it. When we, I mean, we always, clean everything uh, to a good extent if we're doing brews on consecutive days, but then once that run of brews ends, we do an extra thorough cleaning. Got it. So 
That's what John's doing today. You try to make as many batches in one, or as many batches of beer in one of these, like one process. You still have to clean it in between every batch if it's the same type of beer. So in between every batch, we very thoroughly rinse everything with very hot water. Um, but, you know, if we, and sometimes we'll brew two 30 barrel batches in a day. But like a, a typical week, like this week, I'm going to do a single batch today. I'm going to brew back to back batches uh, tomorrow. Um, and then uh, on Monday, I'll do the uh, thorough cleaning with um, more powerful detergents to yeah. really get it good and clean. How long does that take? Uh, that takes uh, three to four hours. Three to four hours. Okay, so you put that back in because it's yep. part of the recipe. Just yep. shot off. That makes sense. Not yet. All right, so we're gonna let that sit for ten minutes, um, just to help make sure that the uh, enzymatic reactions that we want to take place are taking place. A growing number of institutions that award degrees in brewing science. Um, uh, there's not really a standard certification that um, that most brewers have uh, can really vary. I mean, a lot of... I feel like this is an experience trade. You just got to be in it. Yeah. Or, you know, if you're if you're doing what we're doing, uh, I think that's totally true. If you want to try to get a very specialized position in at Miller Coors, then you probably, you know, for hypothetically, you'd want a master's in biochemistry or electrical engineering or wow. just depends on, uh, yeah, I mean. If, if we were at another brewery, most of this equipment looked the same. This is pretty universal stuff. Um, it is pretty universal. It might look different, but it would functionally be uh, at least somewhat similar. Okay. I was looking at all the hoses and the clasps, and it seems specific to this industry, but I have no idea. Um, it's, you know, it's shared in various manufacturing industries, like dairy equipment okay. has a lot in common with brewery equipment. Really? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all stuff. The, 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 you know, the idea is that it needs to be able to be broken down and cleaned thoroughly. So. Uh, From when you started doing this, it was about 10 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. It seems like industry went up and is now leveling and plateauing a little bit. You had a lot of people jump into this industry. Yeah. And I think a lot of people did it for the wrong reasons, just trying to jump on the wave. Yeah. I mean, I, I think more people did it because they wanted to do something that they enjoyed and they liked beer. Um, I don't think, uh, at least in the, I used to know like every small brewery owner in Chicago until it got to a certain point where like when we first opened in 2012 and in the ensuing couple years a bunch of like we were probably like the 12th or 15th brewery in the greater Chicago area in 2012 and now there's like literally 200 or something there's more here than any um, other state yeah I was just reading about that everyone thinks it's Portland and it's it actually used to not be Portland. it used to be Portland now so, it's Chicago it's so crazy. yeah we all used to know each other and then it, it just got too overwhelming we were all got caught up in just trying to run our businesses so uh but I, I i never got the impression that too many people involved were in it for the money okay uh, which is good because there's not a lot of that um, <laughs> but it's uh, truly a passion business yeah yeah i mean i think a lot of people are like like john and i were you know we get to come in and make something that people can enjoy. We get to, you know, have a workplace where we get a lot done, but we don't have to, you know, subscribe to, uh, uh, you know, uh, we can just be ourselves and- Yeah, a lot of corporate rhetoric. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how do you decide these recipes? Well, so we have four breweries sharing this space. Um, and each brewery writes their own recipes. Uh, I do most of the recipes for Burnt City. Um, but then our brewing staff, like, processes all the beers. We, we don't have, like, different staff for the four different breweries because that would I mean, be a wildly sense, but... inefficient way yeah. to do things. Um, so today uh, we're doing a, a beer for Around the Bend. Okay. And uh, 
like this is one uh, it's maui gold a session ipa with pineapple we've done it several times before like so uh the like dan the owner of around the bend is uh like if he's if we're doing a new beer he'll you know be more checking in to you know make sure it's going the way that he <laughs> intends um but like we all use different ingredients different processes um uh, so I do think each brewery maintains a, a distinct um, personality in their beer. And what are the four brands that are here? Uh, Burnt City, Around the Bend, uh, Bold Dog, and Casa Humilde. Okay. Yeah, when Steve told me that idea, I was like, that's really smart. You know, I imagine you don't need all of this for just one brand. Yeah, well, you guys have mass I, production. I mean, you know, <laughs> we were just talking about the explosion of breweries in Chicago, and that very much had an effect on how this came to be, we, we started up uh, our production brewery um, in 2015 with the idea that we were going to make a lot more beer for Burnt City than we uh, ended up being able to sell. So we started um, doing uh, some contract work for Around the Bend. God, is that how it started? And uh, that went pretty well. And we did some contract work for like Hot Butcher and Illuminated Brew Works and a couple other guys, Mars, we did a batch for. Uh, and that that worked well. Like I, you know, we, we have a, uh, we're very transparent about, you know, how we do things and, and uh, uh, I think that uh, the people who have come to work with us understand that. And um, so around the bend and Bulldog, Casa Humilde all uh, were kind of looking for a home where they could expand their production. Um, and uh, so we were, uh, to make a longer story short, essentially our leases on the brew pub and the Southside Brewery were running out around the same time. Um, so we thought, well, it would be cool to move everything into one space yeah. and um, uh, and have, you know, and, sh and share yeah. pool, re pool resources and whatnot. All right, so we're gonna let work flow through our grant, um, which is this uh, little guy here. Um, and what that does is, uh, where it's just fed into the grant um, by gravity. Uh, and then we pump from the grant and that prevents a situation where you have your pump running um, and it sucks grain husks into the screens and clogs them. Um, just ensures a gentle flow from the bottom of the mash tun. Okay, basically filtering? Um, the filtration happens in the mash tun. Okay. This is just a reservoir that collects wort for us to then pump at the moment back in the top, but then we'll also uh, let wort flow through here before we pump it into the kettle. And what's the wort? Wort is uh, just a term for the uh, uh, unfermented beer. Okay, got it. So the first process, if you have to do this by steps, what was the first process? Uh, milling. Okay, so you mill the, mill the grain, right? Yeah. Okay. After that? Mashing. Mashing? Yeah. And is mashing? Mashing's what we have been doing. What we just um, did now is the mashing. Mashing is the enzymatic reaction that, so, so oh yeah, I uh, didn't finish my explanation of that. So when we're steeping the grains around 150 degrees, uh, enzymes that naturally occur in malted grain um, activate and start breaking down the starches in okay. the grains into a variety of uh, sugars of different lengths. So the starches are longer chains of carbohydrates. They're broken down into smaller chains of carbohydrates, which are different types of sugar, some of which are more complex than others. And then uh, depending on what temperature uh, your mash is and what grains you use, you can have different proportions of longer and shorter chains of uh, uh, carbohydrates. And that results in a situation where there are some shorter chains that are fermentable by the yeast that we use and some longer chains that are not, which affects the residual sugar level of your beer, which is very important. Um, okay. Yeah. And then the next step? Uh, so then we did a rest. Um, 
to allow that the enzymatic reaction to occur and uh, Vorlauf to help clean up the wort. Okay. Um, and now we're uh, running the mash off to the kettle, or we're, we will run the mash off into the kettle. We'll boil for an hour, add some hops during that boil. We'll transfer then to uh, the whirlpool. Okay. Um, Got this? Yeah, so the wort flows in through this side arm here. Uh huh. And it creates a. Oh, this is the whirlpool. Yeah, Got it, it creates a whirlpool, um, which helps <laughs> solids um, from the kettle uh, uh, settle out in a cone. Um, during the boil, you get uh, protein breaking out from the wort and uh, hop solids and whatnot. So that collects in the whirlpool. Then we'll uh, run. Uh, the work through the heat exchanger to drop it to fermentation temperature, run it into our tank. Uh, so when you do that, you're raising the temperature? What's that? You're bringing it through? No, we're lowering it from, because it's still, you know, probably 200 degrees in there. Got it, So okay. we want it for this beer. We're probably so is this 70. chilling it? Yeah. Okay, is that, that's, this is a chiller? Yeah. Okay. Looks like a big air conditioner, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it has, it's a two-stage chiller, so first, um, where it runs through these plates parallel to water to cool it down a good amount. And then uh, in the second stage, parallel to glycol, um, which cools it down to around room temperature. Okay. So I'm gonna pick up this uh, metal bin that we're gonna transfer our grains into. It'll still take us three trips. Yeah, we steep the grains and... Uh, That's how I was thinking of it too. I was like, it's like tea or coffee, sorta, of, kinda. Yeah, people always ask like, well, why, why don't you guys bake stuff with it or you know, do this or that? And it's like, well, cause we took all the tasty stuff out of it. Yeah. Tastes like nothing. Yeah. So thankfully it's above zero degrees now and there's not a lot of snow. This part of the process can get a little tricky when there's really horrible weather, but. So do you have to have a special way to dispose of this? Uh, we just put it in our, we just have our garbage service garbage. take it away. Okay. We would love to give it to like a farmer or something, but there's but more breweries the than farmers need grain from at this point. So we're currently transferring work from the kettle to the whirlpool with the idea that we'll spin it around and uh, solids will come out of suspension. Um, so we don't transfer them to the uh, fermenter. But we're also adding hops uh, to the whirlpool. Um, so the hops we added before were added at the beginning of the boil and we would call that uh, a bittering hop addition where um, most of the flavorful, other than bitterness, most of the, like the aromatic uh, kind of fruity vegetal qualities of the hops get cooked off in the boil. Okay and the alpha acids in the hops isomerize uh, and um, which kind of locks them into, uh, into the wort um, and enhances the bitterness that they give off. Uh, so um, uh, we're adding hops to the whirlpool because it's much, because we're not actively cooking it anymore and it's closer to when we're gonna cool it down. So uh, a lot of the, um, so relatively little bitterness is added from that and we get the nice kind of fruity tropical fruit um, uh, or you know or with other hops floral or herbal flavors okay because um, I can smell that right here I know they're in there yeah so the first batch is for the bitter and this is basically for the floral taste and everything else that you're used to okay yeah. cool can we have those there can we look at them yeah so they're pellets whenever yeah. whenever I think of hops I I think of that Sam Adams commercial with that guy putting his face in all the hops. Yeah. So are, how are they pellets? How do they make those? Um, they take fresh hops and they put them through a hammer mill, just compact them into pellets. It's, okay. it's pretty straightforward and it preserves the, the oils that we really want to get into the beer um, uh, that give it a lot of the aroma. So that'd be that better than, a, than fresh hops. Um, I mean, we can get whole cone hops that have been, uh, you know, bagged up uh, in, in packaging that's flushed with nitrogen. So um, it's, uh, 
neither we can also when harvest happen get actual fresh hops okay which haven't been dried uh they're kind of a whole different animal but as far as people generally like would say if, if they were if they had to i hear more knowledgeable people say that pellets are superior for preserving flavor than whole cone hops but you know i don't the the thing about pellets that makes them much easier to work with is that they, when you add them to liquid, it kind of forms like a, a sludge that you can thin out and get to like drain out of here, where if you threw a bunch of flowers in there, it would be a nightmare. We'd to, be doing more with like this situation, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so it's much easier to work with during and after the fact. Yeah. I can see that, that makes sense. Oh, okay. So one part of the process actually that, that uh, I didn't specifically mention um because alex was doing it while we were over doing other things is getting our tank sanitized okay so we have our 90 barrel tank uh that we're going to fill over the course of two days we're doing the first 30 barrels today we're going to do two 30 barrel turns tomorrow so alex had a loop set up uh earlier uh running from the bottom of the tank through a pump through this pipe um which goes up to a spray ball so he uh this tank had previously been cleaned thoroughly on a different day. Um, and so he just uh, uh, mixed up some sanitizer in there, circulated it through the spray ball, took off uh, all the little extra port pieces and sanitized those. And, and so um, what goes in here and what comes out of it? What part of the brewing process? So we're gonna pump our 30 barrels plus of wort in here today okay. and add yeast while we're pumping it in. And then we're do you do that with like with these are you doing the yeast or oh actually today we're doing the yeast we harvested today's yeast from a batch that we brewed last week so we're just going to hook a keg up to that port there and inject it while oh, we cool um but a lot of the time when we were using yeast pitches from a lab we just open the hatches we're filling it and dump the yeast in how do you make these recipes and how do you decide what you're gonna what, what the new flavors are going to be um, I mean, I always have ingredients in mind that I want to try out. Um, and, you know, I get inspiration from seeing what other people are doing. I get inspiration for, you know, Burnt City beers from what other brewers in the building are doing. Um, other people in Chicago or across the world. Uh, and then also one great thing about uh, designing beers here is that I can see in the beer hall what people like yeah. pretty readily. Um, so I get a ton of feedback just from just from looking at sales numbers. Uh, so yeah, I mean these days we're doing a lot of a lot of hazy IPAs. Our, our two year-round beers are a hibiscus IPA and a German-style pilsner, and those sell well here. Um, and so, yeah, when we need a new beer, we, we've also started experimenting with uh, hard sodas and seltzers. Yeah, that's um, a super popular category. Yeah. Uh, so these days when I need to come up with something new, I typically see, you know, want to make sure we have at least one or two hazy IPAs on Burnt City's wall. Uh, we have right now a bunch of really strong beers that were barrel aged that we're still, that we have had for a while and made a good amount of before COVID times and they hold up very nicely and in many cases improve with age. Okay. So it's nice that we can take our time working okay. through those. Um, we, we really like to do uh, like mixed fermentation stuff, experiment with like wild yeast and lactic acid bacteria to do. So does that mean different things that ferment? Yeah. Okay. So I've seen, la I've seen lactose in some beers. What's that all about? Um, well, so lactose <laughs> is milk sugar and, uh, it's different from um, lactobacillus, which is uh, a, a bacteria that produces lactic acid. Oh, got it, okay. Um, so lactose is not fermentable by any of the microorganisms that we purposefully put into our beers, which means like, like if I added uh, cane sugar to a beer, which we do sometimes for various reasons, uh, it would get pretty much entirely fermented out by the, uh, by the yeast um, and so the result would be that it would make the beer stronger but it would not add any residual sugar which actually gives 
the impression of it being drier rather than sweeter. So is that stronger in taste or in alcohol content? Alcohol. In alcohol? Yeah. Okay. And you don't, it doesn't add any sweetness at that point because all the sugar's been broken down by the yeast. Um, lactose doesn't ferment, so if you add it to a beer, it adds sweetness. Are there, so does that mean there's, any, there's some beers that have probiotics in them? Or is it, well, does that get out of the process? Once again, lactose and lactobacillus are different. Sorry, forget about the lactose. Um, uh, lactobacillus, uh, yes, yes, there are beers. Although, a lot of the time, you, you wouldn't get like the dose of it that, you know, taking a probiotic pill. Okay. But people actually, uh, a lot of homebrewers will use probiotic pills to make sour beer. Oh, okay. I never put, connected those two things, but you started saying fermenting. Yeah. I was like, of course. Yeah, there, no, there's no reason why you would have, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. So do you have a, like a catalog you just order things from? If, if you want to try pineapple in something or mango in something? Or I mean, I have a lot of different vendors that we work with. Um, yeah, we have a, a good source for really good quality fruit products. I order most of our grains and hops from one company, but I have like a dozen others that I order from. Um, do they have that type of variety like you uh there's a range i mean there's kind of like two big uh brewery ingredient suppliers um and we mostly go through one uh but sometimes order from the second one because they okay. have different brands of, of malt um uh and then there are a lot of like companies that just sell hops or there's more and more like kind of boutique maltsters starting up that um just sells sort of specialty malts and nothing else uh so there's a range okay how about cbd drinks um we i don't think that you can do cbd in alcoholic beverages in illinois okay. at this point we've been approached by people about it a lot um and it's something that i would totally consider doing i personally don't really believe that cbd does anything yeah <laughs> um which i'm not you know not trying to be a snake oil I'll, salesman but i'll tell you a funny story so i agree with you for me i've tried cbd in multiple forms i've drank it i've smoked it i've taken pills none of it worked my friend he's a mechanic has terrible arthritis uh -huh. only thing that helped him okay right and it, it seems yeah. like for certain people and certain things it, it's a lifesaver well that's great yeah, yeah. i mean i'm not i'm, I'm open-minded about it and you know uh I'm more interested in, in since, since, like if we could do CBD beers, I would be more interested in it, but I, I'm more interested in doing hard sodas or seltzers just because, you know, it's kind of more in line with our, what our business is already doing. Alcoholic beverages, yeah. What about non-alcoholic drinks? That's getting really big too. Uh, I've thought about that too. I've thought, I've thought about making a non-alcoholic soda for yeah. the beer hall. Um, non-alcoholic beer. I'm not aware of a method to make it that's not it, that doesn't involve extremely expensive equipment that sounds really? like it would produce a good uh, 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 anything that tasted good. Um, yeah, you want like a, a vacuum dis, uh, like a vacuum still where it you, your wort it goes through like a vacuum chamber, which makes it uh, helps the alcohol to cook off at a much lower temperature than it would otherwise so you don't have to ruin the flavor by cooking the beer yeah um so you need all new equipment for something like that no or just one piece one very expensive i mean it's like at least 100 grand but okay maybe much more than that i heard those the sales of those have been going up yeah. lately as well yeah no i think i think it would be a great business to try to get into right now uh Uh, yeah, if we had <laughs> a couple hundred thousand dollars just lying around and also <laughs> yeah. room for another big piece of equipment. Yeah. I don't think it's that big. I don't really know. Um, what but, do one of these things cost? And where do you get them? Like, does someone come here and build this and put it together? No. Um, these were, uh, the rough manufacturing was done in China and they were sent to Lincoln, Nebraska, where they were finished and then shipped up here. Uh, they cost, I think, about 50000 each. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so it's been, it's been an adventure having, you know, built out three breweries now, um, which I only take a small amount of credit for. Uh, but as a team, it's been a 
interesting experience and we've learned a lot. This, this brewery, uh, we don't have as much space as we had at our south side location, but it's, it's really, like we've laid it out really nice and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a fun place to make beer. Do you have a consultant or someone that comes in that helps you laying this out or ordering or figuring out what machines you need? <clears throat> Not really what machines we need. Um, that's pretty, I mean, for the, for the brew pub, we, we got everything that we needed. And, you know, between John and Greg and I, we did a lot of research um, and uh, we didn't like completely nail it as far as, uh, as far as the setup, but we were also going into a pretty compact pre-existing space. Um, but uh, no, we've never like really looked for outside help with that. We've just built out more breweries and then seen what, uh, what we could have done better. But um, yeah, this, we, I think we got it uh, right with this one. It's, um, I mean, we're actually relatively, uh, we've got a lot more free space on the floor today than we do a lot of days. It can get kind of cramped, but, but we make it work. Yeah, just watching you guys, it seems like everything flows where it should. Yeah, it's taken a while to, uh, you know, uh, Frankie and Alex have been working for us for about a year and a half now. And uh, it, takes, it takes a good amount of time to kind of get a feel for how to work around each other, which is true for any job, but here, you know, moving stuff with forklifts and pallet jacks and... Uh, you have to develop shorthands for everything. What's that? You have to develop shorthands. Well, we just kind of, we don't really have any special language or anything. We just uh, uh, are kind of aware of who's doing what, when, and who's going to need to go get here or there at a different time. I think they're actually... Uh, running the canning line now. So are the hops a generic commodity or how do you decide where to get them from? And what ones to use? Um, hops are, it's a very interesting market. Um, uh, we source from, uh, generally it, it's like collectives of farms based in the Northwest that, then there's, there's some, a couple in Michigan now. Um, and, uh, a lot of these, a lot of those collectives also um, import hops from other countries. Um, so, uh, and you basically, we have to buy futures. Okay. Um, uh, so we have our hop supply on contract through the end of next year now. Okay. Um, and the market can be pretty volatile, really? uh, which can cause a lot of problems. So we've made the mistake multiple times I can tell it was painful just looking at your it's, eyes it, yeah it, it's frustrating because <clears throat> we'll go through spells where it's really hard to get the hops that we want or the hops we want are really expensive and so we'll sign contracts to get a good deal on them and then you know various factors will then make those hops not what we want anymore trends or or what have you um so and, how do the trends affect it well like early on when we started up like citro which is now hands down the most popular hop for ipas um was only just coming to market and there had just been a terrible harvest year for hops so there weren't a lot of contracting options available so we were able to contract for like cascade and centennial hops um but we couldn't get citra uh we couldn't get any, actually we couldn't get anything for a while. So when we had the chance to get like some cascaded centennial hops on contract, we, uh, we signed up for a pretty good amount. And then all of a sudden, uh, cascade and centennial, which were two like classic IPA hops suddenly fell out of fashion and everybody just wanted Citra. Uh, and so we still used some of the cascade and centennial, but we had, but we didn't use them at the pace that we thought we would. Got it. So what's the deal with hazy IPAs? Why do they taste that and look that way? So um, haze in what I would consider to be made a uh, properly made hazy IPA, which is very much up for debate. Um, it's what? not it's not caused people have this uh, misconception that it's like leftover yeast 
or sometimes, and sometimes it is, uh, or, or hop matter like that didn't get, like we don't filter our beers at all, but we get the solids out of them. Um, and uh, it's actually uh, the haze in the ones that I prefer and the ones that we make comes from a reaction when you add uh, dry hops to an actively fermenting tank um, with, and it only happens with certain yeast strains and you usually have a high protein wort that you get from making it with a higher proportion of like oats or wheat. And then um, uh, a reaction happens where uh, 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 polyphenols and, and proteins come together to form a, a matrix that causes the, the haze. Okay. You see, um, but it only happens with certain yeast strains. What I've noticed is they all look the same, but none of them taste the same. And some of them taste like a standard IPA, yeah. and some of them have a completely different flavor profile. Yeah, I think that's accurate. And that's because of the other ingredients? And it does, is what, what's causing that, or what changes that taste difference? Well, so there are a lot of different, um, people make them a lot of different ways. Some, some uh, brewers go to great lengths to, come, to like vastly minimize uh, the bitterness in the beer. Um, some brewers don't at all. We, we use techniques that reduce the bitterness a good amount, but we, we don't really care if it's completely absent because, you know, we all grew up drinking IPAs and nothing wrong with That's the part bitterness. Of it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I like plenty of the ones that are devoid of bitterness and some of the ones that are pretty bitter. Um, but yeah, it's kind of the the wild west right now for how brewers are doing things. That um, seems to be the most popular beer I'm seeing at least. Yeah. Would you agree? Um, yeah. I mean, it's not what sells the most overall because people still drink five lagers in the time that they would, you know, I believe that. drink yeah. a couple hazy IPAs. Uh, it seems but, like everyone's coming out with one. I yeah. guess a better way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or here, I mean, we've, Burnt City has probably done a dozen different ones at this point. We're doing okay. a new one next week that I'm excited about, um, like trying different combinations of hops and grains and stuff. That's awesome. We have, we have air conditioning in here, which is not typical for breweries, and it, I'm really thankful for it. It does, you know, it gets hotter. We don't keep it at, you know, 70, but um, it's not too bad. Most breweries don't have AC? Uh, of our size, I would guess the majority don't, but I guess I don't know for sure. Certainly been in a bunch of breweries where it was not very fun to hang out because it was extremely hot or extremely cold. We also, I mean, like today we didn't have much in the way of shipments going in and out, but days when we have to open the garage door constantly, um, it can get pretty cold. All right. So I'm just breaking down my transfer equipment and let it sit in our detergent. Okay, so you have a three sink, just like a kitchen. Yep. Yeah. Typically have uh, this filled with um, PBW, which is powdered brewery wash, which is an alkaline detergent that is, uh, I don't know why they don't sell this for home use. It's incredible it uh cleans stuff very well and is not uh given how effective it is it's amazing that it's not more dangerous like it you just breaks everything down uh everything that we're likely to cake onto our equipment i mean you can see the stuff i'm putting in just had wort running through it and i just rinsed it so it's not very dirty but um you can take pretty dirty stuff and clean it real good in there I was getting to an argument about dishwashers. What's the, what's the point of a dishwasher? What's its job? What's the point of a dishwasher? What's the job of a dishwasher? To wash dishes. I'd argue it's there to sanitize dishes because it doesn't really do a good job of washing most of the time, Some right? do. Some, Some do, do more than others. Like my mom insists that you should not rinse your dishes before you put them in her dishwasher because she says it cleans better when the dishes are dirtier, which really? doesn't, doesn't make sense to me, but yeah. oh, I shouldn't go on record saying that. <laughs> so we just did everything today. Can you run through where we started and where we ended? Sure, so it started with uh, uh, the grains getting milled mostly yesterday. Um, 
and then we augured those grains over to the mash tun there uh, where we steeped them in hot water to make our wort which we then ran off into our kettle we boiled for an hour added some of our hops then and uh, then transferred from the kettle over to the whirlpool um, added some more hops uh, in the whirlpool let some of those solids settle out and we then uh, Pumped, uh, pumped our wort through our heat exchanger, chilling it down to fermentation temperature, uh, pumping it into our fermenter, which we had. When you said fermenta fermentation temperature, what is that? Um, it's 69 degrees for this beer. Okay. Uh, different beers, uh, you know, different yeasts behave differently at different temperatures and also behave differently in different styles of, of beer. Uh, so this is um, an American ale yeast that we're using for this beer, uh, which has a pretty clean, slightly fruity flavor, and um, it functions well kind of in the mid 60s to low 70s. Okay. What was the next step? Uh, so as we transferred the wort into the fermenter, uh, I uh, added some yeast that we had harvested from another batch, and that's, that's it. That's it. So I, f I felt like this was industrial size making of coffee. And it's oversimplifying it. Well, so, it, so, so to, right. the, today's activity is certainly comparable. Um, what happens after today is tremendously different. So what happens um, after today? Sure. Uh, so uh, our yeast will kind of wake up and start converting sugars in our wort to uh, alcohol and carbon dioxide and lots and lots of different flavor compounds. Um, so that'll... The fermentation should take about a week for okay. a, this is a fairly light beer. Um, so, uh, and is that it's sitting in one of these vats when that's happening? Yeah. Well, so actually tomorrow I'm going to brew two more batches of the same beer to add oh, okay. to, uh, to this tank. Um, so that will that beer just sit in there in the meanwhile? Yeah. So, okay. so, so as the yeast starts doing its thing, it multiplies extremely rapidly and it, it ends up working well to um, do a partial batch on the first day if you're trying to like fill a large tank and then add to it the next day because the yeast will multiply it and it's ready for more food. Um, so fermentation will take about a week. It'll, uh, uh, you know, alcohol will be um, created and uh, um, flavors will change. We'll do a dry hop through the top of the tank after fermentation has subsided. What's that? Um, that's where we take hop pellets like we saw earlier and we just dump them into the beer either while it's fermenting or after it's fermented. And so I was talking earlier about how heat, you know, uh, destroys some of the flavor and aroma compounds in hops. When you add them um, to a room temperature batch, uh, it takes on a lot of the aroma, like very little bitterness. Um, and it's an important step. Uh, uh, pretty much any IPA you're going to drink these days probably was dry hopped um, or some, you know, or had hop, hop extracts added to it or something. Uh, so you're always going to have three stages of it, or three stages of the hops going in? in? No, 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 it can vary a lot. There okay. Can be, Is that just for an IPA or most IPAs? Um, so m most beers in general have anywhere from one to three hop additions at different stages on the brew day, sometimes more. Um, IPAs can have, I mean, the one I'm gonna do next week has, I'll do one addition in the kettle, three in the whirlpool. I guess that's what we did today. And then I'll do two dry hops on it. Um, it can really vary. Okay. Um, so then what else happens after that? It ferments and then is that it? it ferments, we dry hop it, we uh, bring the tank down to 32 degrees to uh, halt. Uh, look, fermentation will have halted at that point anyway, but it, it, yeast drops out of suspension at that point um, and the beer clarifies, flavors start to mature a little bit um, and then we'll transfer it into one of our bright tanks. Uh, Say that again? Our, uh, one of our bright tanks. Okay, and what's um, that? It's a tank where beer is uh, carbonated and then packaged off of. Um, so carbonation uh, you know, just takes a few hours and um, we do that by injecting uh, carbon dioxide through a, a stone tube that 
helps dissolve it. Wow. Um, you can, you can uh, create carbonation as part of your fermentation as well. Um, we prefer to, to use the carb stones because it's just a little more predictable okay. how it'll end up. Um, and then we will, usually most beers spend about three to five days in the bright tank. And then we, uh, once it's carbonated, we can can it and keg it. And uh, that's the process. Cool. Thanks so much for this. It was yeah. so much fun. No, thanks for coming it was, in. it was such a long process. And when I said it was like coffee, I mean, like the simplest form of what you did. And then you have all the steps afterwards. And you have this beautiful product that comes out afterwards. It was great. I mean, yeah, it's, it's fun. Uh, fun holding a can in your hand after you spent anywhere from a couple weeks to a, a couple years, you know, uh, working on uh, something and yeah, having it turn out the way that you hoped or yeah. Awesome. Thanks again. Yeah. My pleasure. Right. Uh, sure. So we are canning the bulldog brewing frumpy goblin today. This is a new beer, so I have never tried it. Uh, beer is gonna come out of that and possibly spray you. So previously we've sanitized everything. Um, when this line is running well, we can do about a case a minute and sometimes it runs well. Um, that's relatively slow. I thought it'd be faster than that. It's, uh, it does make for some long days, but like yeah. today we're doing a seven barrel batch. So we're only going to do about 50 cases. Uh, it's a yeah, pretty short run. And so is this here so you can taste it during the process? Make sure it's okay. It's, it's actually not hooked up to anything, <laughs> although it is a real handle. So we could, we could hook a keg up to there. Okay. Is there any particular reason there's this twist? Um, so it slows the cans down and then originally the canning line came with a rinser so it would spray water in there when it was upside down. Got it. Uh, we did some testing on dissolved oxygen and found that we were adding a lot of dissolved oxygen. Basically, unless you what buy- What is dissolved oxygen? So, um, uh, well, it's just oxygen that ends up in the package dissolved in the beer, which then causes staling. Gross, yeah. Yeah, so uh, until you can get like de-aerated water or uh, deoxygenated water, um, we found that the negative impact outweighed the positive impact. We don't have infections in our cans, so, so you know we would rather we would rather risk the occasional infected can, which hasn't happened, than know that we're making every single can stale. That makes perfect sense. Um, so, so, so originally there was going to be some type of device contraption that hit it right here. Yeah, originally it. there were nozzles that would spray. I can see where the clamps are. Yeah, it would sort of spray in there, and then, but it didn't give it time to drain got it. right so so oh, every so, so every it would flip can, it would come down yeah and so instead of doing it here now you do it over there after the beer's already been put inside right well yeah we rinse it because beer gets all over everything but yeah. um but the idea is to rinse the inside of the can which we determined was counterproductive ah uh, okay got it, um, got it and you know i mean we someday might well they come clean they haven't right been, Exactly. It's all, it already comes sterilized. We keep them covered. So, uh, and, and yeah, like I said, we haven't had problems. So. Okay. So we've got to cool down, cool everything down, which does involve, unfortunately, wasting some beer. So the cans get purged with CO2 again to try to reduce the oxygen level as much as possible. I always taste one to make sure it's the right beer. 
and that it's properly carbonated. If either of you would like probably the freshest beer you'll ever have, we're also going to look at the the uh, the inside of the seam goes kind of like this. So we're going to check the inside and make sure it's working properly. At this point, I have them memorized, but, you know, trying to make sure that all of these basically are in spec. Otherwise, you can get leaking cans, and that's no good. There's so many fine details right in this process. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's amazing nothing has gone wrong yet. I mean, <laughs> like every part. It's that bad. Every part breaks. So the original idea was that we would print them in-house, but uh, those would just run really badly. The printer that we got sold, which cost as much as a car, um, would not deal with the wet cans. So, so you buy these labels We, we buy else? the labels, yeah. Which, you know, it's okay. So what, what does this whole setup here cost? Oh, geez, we bought it piecemeal a long time ago. So yeah. I am honestly not sure what it all costs when you add it together. Uh, We're talking 50 grand, more or less? I think probably all together, it's uh, probably closer to 100. So what, what's this, what is weeks. this one? It's, so Jerome there is the uh, Old Dog Brewing owner, and so this is his recipe. Oh, no way. And uh, it's uh, the Frumpy Goblin Hazy IPA. Uh, so yeah, I could get Jerome. Oh, OK. So we, we just, uh, the lid, we had one that didn't have a lid go into the steamer. And luckily, it usually can tell when that happens and reject it automatically. When it doesn't, and then it tries to seam it, then it gets stuck on the chuck, and then it just keeps jamming more and more. Oh, wow. In. Get close. Can you get a closer to that? Uh, it I will, just realized how it's tight. It will spray. Oh, that's okay. Okay. This whole rig here is unbelievably... He's dropped that. It's like, I can't believe how much damage that thing can take. Oh, yeah. So you just watch this during the whole time, making sure it's going smoothly. Yeah, changing the lids and uh, making sure the layers transfer smoothly. And what's his name? Uh, Jerome. Jerome. Hi, my name is Jerome Stantz. I'm the uh, owner and founder, main guy of Bulldog Beer Company, and welcome to Brew Yards. So we just ran into you over here. Yes. They're making your beer right here. Yes. This beer is fantastic, by Thank the way. That, that's the beer. Frumpy Goblin, this is our newest release. I actually haven't tried it uh, as it's been fully carved up. Oh, perfect. So give me one second. It's good. Cool. So how do you create this recipe? Uh, this recipe in particular, uh, you can kind of see right here. Uh, that's Who's a Hazy Boy? That's our most popular hazy IPA. Uh, that's anywhere from 60 to 70% of our sales each month. So wow. uh, we've had quite a bit of success with Hazy Boy. Um, when I started brewing, I just like doing really weird stuff. Uh, it's just my wife and I right now. Um, and we just kind of liked experimenting with different flavors, different profiles. Um, I really think there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with yeast. And that's kind of what we've been doing with our newest uh, hazy IPAs that aren't Who's a Hazy Boy. Um, so we kind of just try a new yeast that's non-traditional for hazies, and then when we find cool hops, uh, we try to use those as well. So uh, this one in particular, this is Frumpy Goblin. Uh, so this is a 6% pale ale, uh, uses Mosaic and Simcoe, very popular hops, but the main dry hop is Callista. It's a German hop that has nice tropical citrusy kind of notes to it. Uh, but what really excites me about this beer is it uses Omega Yeast Lab Bonanza. And what that is, is a Hefeweizen yeast that has the clove notes to it removed. So they're using kind of like a genetic engineering CRISPR, if you're familiar. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. If they're they're gene editing the hops? Uh, the yeast. The yeast, okay. The yeast, actually. So, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the two main, like, character profiles that you get from a Hefeweizen yeast are banana and clove. 
Uh, so what this CRISPR technology has done with Bonanza, or Bonanza, has removed the clove, so it's supposed to be all banana on the roma. So it's smooth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really, really smooth. So there's some wheat in there as well that you know helps uh, soften the body and the mouthfeel. Um, and there's a lot of oats in there. I mean, we use oats and wheats to kind of soften the palate a little bit. And uh, yeah, what other questions do you have about it? <laughs> How, how'd you decide to do this? Because this facility is so unique where they're bottling for other people or they're, yeah. is that the right word? Is it bottling or? Canning. They're canning it packaging. for packaging. Yeah. They're doing the whole process. So do you just go to them with your recipe and they give you a price that, uh, that's going to cost for each of these? And then when you, when they're finished over here, are you in charge of distribution then? Yeah. Yeah, okay. so, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, I come up with the recipe, I submit it to uh, Ben or John, and they kind of put it in the schedule. Uh, depending on the size, Christian or Ben will be the ones that brew it, but uh, they usually, because you can kind of see the grains up there, we buy in bulk for our malt, um, and that just gives us a discount, you know, lower price point. So do you buy the raw materials then and I store it here? You do uh, not. If we have hops that are unavailable to us in-house, I order all the hops, but in terms of grain and the yeast, uh, the brew team takes care of the ordering for me. Okay. I basically submit them a request saying, I need this beer by this date, uh, I need this size, you know, tell me when you need everything from me. Uh, I personally try to make sure I have all ingredients and all labels before they even get started, but I'm one person running a business with my yeah. wife, so. So how do you get this on shelves? Uh, I go out and I talk to people and I say, do you want to try my beer? And hopefully they say yes. <laughs> what made you want to do this? Uh, what made me want to do this was I worked in the corporate world for 10 years uh, and I just got tired of it. Um, I worked for a very large software company and uh, I just got tired of the nepotism and the favoritism, uh, especially when it was extreme. There's, there's nepotism in a large software company? There is. <laughs> uh, I mean, managers that hire their best friends and the best friends get okay. you know, promotions and the other people that are working their asses off. I, I'm not including myself in that. There's a lot of my friends that I really thought should have gotten raises and promotions that didn't. And uh, just one year, I got tired of it, and then I had started home brewing. Uh, we had an opportunity to brew exclusively for a restaurant that fell through, but since we had already had the wheels in motion, my wife and I just said, let's go for it. So that gave you the opportunity. That gave you want to push off and do that. That gave us the motivation to know our beer was good enough that when a buyer for a restaurant is like, I think your home brew is good enough, uh, to sell here and we want to sell it exclusively here. That was what gave me the confidence to know my beers were good enough to pursue it. Uh, and then from there, it's been a learning experience. Uh, I'm, I am very, I like to believe I'm very honest with everybody and I'm very open about mistakes that I've made through the last almost five years. And it's a learning thing, you know? Uh, one of the best piece of advice is that I got from another owner uh, before we even got started, another brewery owner, I should say, was, uh, you know, I, 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 we met, uh, he was at another brewery that my wife and I were visiting. I said, you know, what's, what's the best advice that you can give me? He said, the beer industry is all about, if something goes wrong, not freaking out about it, realize what needs to be done to fix it and move on. And that's kind of a uh, mentality that I've tried to have over the last several years is if a beer doesn't work, we tried it. If, uh, you know, we had a couple duds when we opened up here that I thought we were going to do very well and they didn't. So, uh, yeah, it just, uh, you move on. You learn from your mistakes and say, okay, maybe the profile on this one wasn't as good as we thought it was. Maybe it just didn't appeal to people because it's a beer de garde, which is a very obscure French style. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I just try to learn as much as I can and go from there. <laughs> How do you make the leap from home brewing in your basement or your living room, whatever, yeah. to here? Because this, this shows me you're an entrepreneur. This tells me, like, hey, I'm going to make this work. And you're figuring it out as you go. And you've been doing this for five years now? Uh, November will be five years. Okay. Uh, is that five years since you quit your job? Uh, no, that's five years uh, since the brewery has been selling beer. Okay. Yeah, we had about a year ramp up period. It took 50 weeks uh, to get our licensing when we first applied. Wow, 50 weeks. Yeah. Is that licensing through the city or the state or that both? That was through the state and uh, federal. Yeah. Okay. So federal took, uh, that was 42, 43 weeks, wow. something like that. And then the state took like six or seven. 
Uh, what, what type of regulations are they looking for? What, what is the process? Well, back then there was a new brewery, op there was like two or three breweries open a day and there was a ton of backlog. Okay. So it was just a, a resources thing kind of thing. I talked to uh, the woman at the TTB, which is the federal agency that regulates beer. And, you know, I asked her about it and she's like, we're doing the work of five people and it's me and one other person. And, and it's government, so no one's staying past <laughs> probably four actually. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> It, it used to be the ATF, which was alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, and it's since devolved into the TTB. And uh, yeah, they they've cut a lot of government spending, and because they cut government spending, they're understaffed, and it is what it is. Uh, so that's yeah, that's what it was. It took about a whole year to get licensed. So you and your wife are pushing this. Yep. What's your daily? What's a day look like? Or give me a week. Uh, a week for me is Monday is usually admin stuff. Uh, so that's getting caught up on sales, planning out my sales week, where I need to go, uh, who might need a refresh this week, uh, stuff like that. Uh, usually Monday, if I can get done with my admin stuff early enough, I'll go out and do a couple sales. Uh, Tuesday is mostly sales. Wednesday, I do mostly sales, some deliveries if I can. Thursday is mostly deliveries. And then if I have any suburb deliveries I need to take care of, those are usually Friday. Um, and then if I don't have to do that, I try to take Friday afternoon off and, okay. uh, to spend with my son because I have an 18 uh, month Congrats. old. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's another thing during all of this is I we got married you know, halfway through our brewery experience and then we had our first child. Uh, he was born in August. This place opened in April, so uh, about you know, five months after. Tight timelines. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So you're even doing all the deliveries. I mean, you are a two-person operation. And how many of these cans? I mean, this you got a ton of stuff right here. I don't know if it's the lot or a little, but it looks like a lot to me. And is this yours above it too? Uh, no, no, that's Burn so City. Ours are here, 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 here. Uh, those two stacks right there. Oh wow, you're all over the place. And here. then that stack right there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is roughly, probably 10 to 12 barrels of beer, I would guess. Not, I mean. How many is that in cans? Uh, so there's 24 cases, or 24 cans in each case. Each layer is 10 cases. Uh, so 40, 30, 30, 50, 30. 70, 20, I mean, there's a lot. So you're the graphic artist, you do all the work for uh, well? Actually, my friend Sarah does the graphics. No kidding. Yeah, uh, so she's one of my friends that I met at college. Uh, she was a year younger um, and we just kind of became friends. And then, oh, four years ago? Yeah, about four years ago at one of the summer festivals, we ran into her and she was like, I thought you were kidding about opening a brewery. I was like, no, nah, <laughs> we did. And she's like, oh my God, like, all I want to do is design a beer label and I can die happy. And I was like, okay. So that label basically became this. I nice. mean, it's a variant of this. Um, we've kind of gone through some branding. A mango, paella, Hefweizen? Yeah. Okay. I love uh, Hefweizen. Our number two seller. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Sarah did that design and everybody's just like, I really dig the new look. So we stuck with it. What are some of your favorite beers? Uh, my favorite beers are going to be Hazy Boy. Um, I really like CeeLo. That's one of my favorites. Uh, Motivator is a coffee Doppelbach. Nice malty coffee. Uh, but probably the beer I drink the most currently is Sunday Night Couch Cuddles. That's <laughs> our India Pale Lager. That's so, a great name. Thank you. Uh, that's actually my two bulldogs on the, the label. So that's Vinny and then that's Charlie. Nice. Um, but yeah, that's like everything I currently want in a beer. Uh, it's light, easy drinking, but there's hot presence to it. So like it makes it interesting. And I feel like that can be a problem with some lagers is that they're just kind of one note, but uh, I just really like this one. Yeah. Have, have you been to Galleria Liquors? I actually just left there. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. You're doing with Ben there? Uh, wait, which one? So the one on Any Wells? One. Yeah, so I just left the one on Wells. Okay. And then I'm heading to the one on Southport uh, maybe today, probably. You're dropping off? Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. We did an interview with them too. Awesome. It's funny, like all, every interview leads to another interview. Awesome. Everywhere we go. Cool. Uh, I, 
the who do you, who do you know here? Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. So I just met George today, but Steve owns Southport yep. Corridor. One of my best friends worked there forever. She used to run the whole place. Yeah. She moved out to Austin, and then when he was opening that back up, I wanted to do an interview with him. Yeah. And that's how we got here. Oh, cool. Yeah. And we really oh. wanted to be in a brewery, and this is the coolest process. Yeah. So, who are your number one buyers? Are you selling this more to liquor stores, restaurants, like Binnie's, or how uh, do you distribute this? Mostly the craft shops. Uh, so, some of our biggest accounts are going to be Bottles and Cans, Beer Miscuous, Bitter Pops, uh, L&M Fine Foods that's up on Lincoln and Montrose. We just started selling to them last summer, and they be quickly became one of our biggest supporters. Okay. Uh, we're actually going to be making a beer for them this summer that cool. they're going to sell out of their own store. So, super excited about that as well. Nice. Um, but yeah, it's just, like I said, day by day and figuring out what works and what doesn't. <laughs> I'm loving this beer. I Thank really you appreciate so much. it. I'm glad you were here. This is so, just happened. Yeah, <laughs> I made a delivery and then I came here to see the progress of how the canning was going. And Yeah, great. Thanks for telling your story. Yeah, thank you so appreciate much. I'm editing the video right now. I'm on the Metro. You can see it right here. And I had no idea Adam put in this really great section with Willie Q. I'm really excited. So check this out. It's Adam's first time uh, talking to people directly and asking questions. And I love the initiative he took here. Hope you enjoy. So yeah, I'm the chef here at uh, Lily's Q. Uh, my name is Jose Landa. I've been with the company for 10 years. Uh, Lily's has been open for about 10 years, going on 11. Yeah. Uh, we're making today the buffalo uh, smoke wings, uh, homemade buffalo. Uh, chicken tenders, we'll probably do uh, three style. We'll do the original, the Nashville hot, and the buffalo. Uh, we also doing a chicken sandwich, which uh, comes with a brioche bun, a uh, little bit of pickle slaw, uh, with a little bit of ivory sauce on top. It's really delicious. So yeah, I opened that place uh, back in 2010. Oh yeah, man, I love barbecue. It's uh, one of my favorites, actually. Okay, then uh, these wings will look like they're ready. Throw a little bit of buffalo. When people say uh, they really like buffalo feed-ups, you, you just... No, I like to try different, different styles for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like I said, we're make, we've been making this for a while. Yeah. Uh, but a lot, a lot of people like to put their own twist on it. It's really fun to try too as well. Yeah. All right. Wings go here, a little bit of ranch, homemade ranch here. So we actually do our regular buffalo sauce. We throw a little bit of cayenne pepper in there yeah. just to give it a little more heat. Yeah. I like that. Uh, we used to do actually put a little bit of botch uh, pepper on it oh, yeah. back in the day, yeah. but it's really hard to get. So, I mean, a lot of people, like I said, a lot of people like spice, a lot of people don't. The way we make it now, it's actually kind of went a little bit down heat, heat wise. Yeah. But I mean, like other people like Nashville hot too as well. That's homemade here. That's overpowering for myself a heat, but I still love it. Uh, did you see that show, uh, Hot Ones? Oh, yeah, actually, yeah. That was that one's pretty cool. I've seen a couple of ones. They get intense. They get really, really cool with it. And they actually kind of surprised they're, try they're trying the last sauce. Oh, yeah. I mean, why not? Yeah, they're there. They have to try it. A couple of more minutes on that one. You ever tried a hot sauce in the million Scoville? No, man. I think the hottest I've done was uh, habanero. Oh, yeah? That's the okay. hottest I'll go. Fair enough, man. Fair enough. You don't want to ruin the taste buds just yet. Exactly. Uh, yeah, these are almost ready. And like I said, we'll do a couple of different sauces there so you can try them. You already got the buffalo. Do you like spice or no? A little heat. A little heat? Yeah. All right. So we'll do the sandwich original. Ready to go. There. And the slaw right on top. That's the coolest idea, honestly. <laughs> I don't see why more people do that. Okay. Alright. We'll do two tenders. Original there for you. And then we do a tender sauce, which is mayo, ketchup. Onion powder, garlic powder, a little bit of pepper in there. Then we have our Nashville hot sauce here. In-house for sure, made with a uh, 
our trimming of the pork. This is gonna be more more heat for sure than the buffalo. So I'm just gonna give you one there for you so you could try. Got some blue cheese there, homemade as well. All right. There we go. 